So thanks so much, everybody. I know it's a super busy time of the semester for all of you, um, but really excited that we're able to get together, especially around um, this topic that we're super excited about. I think it's so timely. I know for, um, as I've been meeting with um, several of you individually, and then as, especially for our group yesterday, when we did our um, coffee break session, a lot of topics came up around how we can um, engage and also support our students who are participating in the STEM core and sort of like the challenges that come along with that. So very timely that we're gonna have this conversation today. I am personally excited because um, our, our facilitator today, um, Ms. Lachelle R. Cross is um, one of my dear friends and colleagues from grad school and um, an expert in um, working with students and supporting around um, diversity, equity, and, and inclusion. So I'm very excited to hear from her today. And also she had the opportunity to speak with a lot of our students last week as well um, in a session around support as well. So without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Lachelle to lead today's session. Yay, thank you, Cheryl. That was too good of an introduction. You called me an expert. <laughs> and now I feel like the expectations are going to be way too high. No, I can't. No. I can't. I'm going to share my screen. I hope you can see what I'm seeing. Let's see. I don't know if you're, hopefully you see the actual slideshow and not my, um, not my, there we go, and not the facilitators thing. So I'm going to press that, hopefully. Are you seeing the slideshow or do you see like my? Um, we see the facilitator so we can see like where it says next slide oh, on yeah. the side. Oh, I'm going to reverse that. I have, I always share the wrong screen when I have the two screens. I never know which one is the correct one. So I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to do that again. More technology challenges. Hopefully this time it is correct. All right, there we go. All right, now you see the slides, Joe, correct? Perfect, all right. yeah. Great, great, great. So thank you all for having me today. Um, and Cheryl mentioned that I was the expert, but honestly, I really wanna um, come at this as like a conversation um, and really gonna be talking to you a lot from my own experience, um, from what the research says and from what I've experienced from uh, talking directly with the students. So to kind of give you a little context, my name is Michelle. I got my bachelor's degree in communication, so that's why I have a big mouth. Um, I uh, work, um, I got my master's degree in higher education at Syracuse with Cheryl, and I've been doing this for about 13 years. And so I started off in grant programs. I worked a little bit in housing and residence life. I've supported students of, uh, in DEI initiatives at a, very, a variety of levels through coursework. Um, and so a lot of my knowledge will come from um, those experiences. But again, you also all have very valuable experiences. So as I'm talking, if there's anything that you want to share, at, please feel free to use the chat. Um, I think we learn better together. Um, and I learned a lot of this from, from the work that I've done with, with colleagues such as yourself. So please feel free um, to add that. And so here's a little bit of a rundown of the things that I hope to cover today. So I'm going to talk about engaging our students um, and how that impacts student success. But as we know, there's some challenges when it comes to you know, engaging our students. So we're going to talk about that. And and try to see how we can maybe um, think about overcoming some of those challenges. Um, and then I'm also gonna um, hit on some of uh, Brene Brown's work around belonging, vulnerability, and courage, and how we can use that to impact the, the engagement that we are doing with our students. Um, and then wanna leave some time for us to talk to each other and, and kind of come up with some suggestions. Because again, you know, I, I feel like oftentimes when I'm talking, it's not necessarily about giving you new information, but hopefully giving you um, the inspiration to think about it in a different perspective or, add something to what you're already doing. So that's really where we're going with this. So when we think about engaging our students, I think it's really important to think about our students as whole people. And I think a lot of times we've run into trouble with engaging them because we're so focused on what we have to accomplish that we forget that they have all of these other things that they're bringing in with them, right? And so, and a lot of times too, even with that, we're often looking at things around race and culture, um, but they're, because they're the most, it's the easiest to see, right? We, we, it's the first thing we notice about people, but there's so much more to our students and the things that they're experiencing that are really important to think about. So their gender, their ability, you know, these are things that you don't necessarily know right off the bat, um, but that will absolutely play into our students and how they feel about themselves and their engagement with the topics around them. And so it's important to think about intersectionality, right? Like, the, the, and, and think about it even for us, like we don't just uh, put who we are on the shelf to come to work, it all comes with us and informs how we interact and informs the things that we care about. And so it's important to think about that. And so some of the ways that we can, uh, 
think intersectionally in our work is considering how are we affirming our own students, our students' identities, and not just the race and the culture, but also other identities that we may not be able to easily see. Um, how are we providing representation for students so that they can see their whole selves as a part of the, the programs and the initiatives that we want? Um, and then also to, um, when it comes to the to recognizing our students as whole people, it's really important to have community building space. And so one of the things I'm going to talk about, which I think is often hard for people who are in um, STEM, you know, focused uh, uh Kind of areas is like it's not always about the academics like and I know that that's important and it's hard to admit that but that's really what a lot of it has to do with if you have to provide community building space um and then and having that focused on peer-based learning right have it, they learn better from each other and so those are ways that we can kind of make sure that we're uh, considering the students as whole people as we move through um through working with them and so I also want to just take a second as we uh, before we continue the conversation though, to just highlight like what you do is important and it really does matter, right? And so I, as you if you find yourself frustrated that students aren't getting engaged, I understand that because we know how valuable it is, right? And so you know, I just wanted to kind of highlight that because the research shows that students that are engaged are more likely to succeed and more likely to be motivated. Um, we also found that students that are engaged will are more likely to do well academically, right? And so we want to make them engaged because we know how successful they can be. Um, and then also, you know, along with that, the research also shows that if we're perceived as approachable and sensitive to our students' needs, they are more likely um, and they're more committed to working harder and getting more out of the sessions or the, the experiences that we provide for them. And so it really is a, a, a relationship that's important to build. Um, and that's why we're talking about this today. So <laughs> I'm gonna take it, I, I talk really fast. So again, if you need me to stop, wanna jump in, ask a question, I do not mind being interrupted. I often need that, so please feel free. But I wanna think about some of the challenges to student engagement. And some of this is stuff that Cheryl mentioned, but I also would love to hear from you all in the chat if there are other things that you've been noticing that you find have been your challenges to engagement. Um, but oftentimes I notice that academic preparation is a challenge to our students um, being able to engage. They are so worried about their grades and what they uh, need to study that it's hard to think about um, the, engage, the, the enrichment opportunities that might fall outside of those parameters, right? And so I see that a lot with our STEM-focused students. They come in and they're like, listen, I got to do bio. I don't got time for, you know, you talking about research. How does that impact my grades, right? They don't often, and because they are also often starting um, from a level of like, you know, less preparation, again, they want to spend most of their time doing things that they feel directly impact their grades. And they don't really care about some of what I call the fluff, so to speak, right? And then the other thing I think that challenges student engagement, which I'm going to be talking a little bit, um, a lot about throughout this presentation, is deficit model thinking slash programming, right? And so a lot of times when we talk about students, especially from diverse backgrounds, we often talk about how much they lack preparation, right? And we also know that because of the many things that, you know, the many social identities they bring in with them, such as race, gender, ethnicity, they often have some really negative experiences, and they're very aware of oftentimes the limitations that they may be facing. A lot of times what we do as practitioners that we don't realize is that we we kind of focus in and double down on those. And so we're like, yes, you need more preparation. You need, you know, we're adding to the doom and gloom and we're not realizing that some of the reasons students don't engage with us is because we're confirming their fears about them not being prepared. And so it's really important to think about how are we, how when are we doing that? And how maybe we can move away from that in some ways. So that's something that we'll think about. Um, lack of representation, right? So just being able to see yourself in there. And one of the things that I'm going to talk about when I talk about lack of representation and mentorship, it's not just about fitting in. It's about helping our students feel like they belong to these majors and these programs. Um, and those two things aren't always the same. Like just because our students are fitting in in these programs doesn't mean that they feel like they belong. And that may be why there's some challenges to engagement as well. Um, and then the other thing I also see a lot with students is this false or limited perception around like career outlooks and opportunities that keeps them from engaging with maybe some things that are not necessarily a part of the traditional academic track. Um, and so a lot of our students, they're like, I want to be a doctor or I want to be a nurse. You know, they don't know that there are so many facets. Like, I'm just so fascinated by how many people and how many layers there are when you look at any science field, right, whether it's biology, chemistry. Uh, computer technology, there is no one real role that you could have. 
But oftentimes our students are, they, they have that limited perception. They think that they have to go, you know, from A to B to C. And it's like, there are jobs and opportunities out there that may not even exist yet, or, you know, are just now coming into the forefront um, that you may be able to excel at, and they're not able to see that. And so helping our students understand um, that um, there's a bigger field out there can also help with their engagement. So I, but I saw some comments, so I wanted to step back, uh, ask extension. Rel religion is a big one. And, and yes, I uh, that def definitely impacts how our students engage with the, the things around them. Um, students making time for workshops, right? Right? They will all, they feel like this stuff is not the important thing. It's like, and like, we know how valuable it is, but, in, and one of the reasons they don't feel like this is, is valuable is because they feel like if I'm behind already, I don't have time for that. And you already said that I need to get better at math. So shouldn't I be doing that? Right? Like, shouldn't I be spending? And so it's, it's, it's understandable why they feel that way. But it's, it's, it's good to think too, then if we know that, how can we maybe change their perception around that? Is there a way that we can maybe remove some of the pressure around preparation and, and studying? Because one of the things I also see, one so in my current role, I, I oversee a first year seminar where I meet with the students one by one and we talk and a lot of our students, like maybe two thirds are going into STEM too. And one of the things I, I noticed with students that feel unprepared that I've noticed over and over again, is the overstudying that they do. Like they will sit down for six hours at a time, like I gotta figure it out. And most of the time, actually when I'm talking to them, and it's because they have this pressure built up that I've, you know, I've missed things. I need to put in time to get better at it. And yes, you do need to put in time, but because of that, now they have the six hour gap and they're not willing to consider any other opportunity because that's the time that they need to dedicate to getting better at it. But then when you mm -hmm. talk to them, it's like, okay, of that time, how much of that are you actually working on problems? How much of that? And so they they still feel obligated to commit these long periods of time to these subjects, but it's really not even effective time. Like they're not even really using it well. And so once I'm able to help them like think about their time in a way where it's more efficient and practical, students are often a little bit more open to uh, considering some of those extracurriculars. So that's just something to throw out there that I thought of as we were talking. Um, and Lachelle, that's a good, really good point too that you bring up. I think this came up yesterday um, for those of you who are at our coffee break around like the balance with students participating in the STEM core, because obviously like we focus on academics, but we have this built-in programming in as well. And a lot of us are seeing like lower turn up like students not turning up for programming, but then they're also realizing or understanding that they need to attend workshops to be able to have that career exploration, but then they don't have time. But in, and it's like that balance that a lot of us are trying to play in terms of how do we keep them focused on academics, but also like motivated and exposing them to the field. Um, so I think our support specialists and all of you are tasked with a very difficult um, task is striking that balance, but also supporting students. So yeah, and I will tell you, at least from my, and this is the part that I think is, it takes a lot of work, right, to support students, let's just say that, and especially students that when you have to do undo all of the, the stuff that all of the experiences they, they've had before you, um, and so one of the things I've also found really helpful, and I think it's, it's definitely, I've seen it happen more and more as the generations have changed, but is you can't just talk to students and tell them what they need, you have to show them, like you can't, they, if you say, hey, you need to find a balance, they'll they'll shake their head, they'll understand, but they're not going to do it. You got to pull out the schedule and say, hey, let you say you don't have time. Okay, so how are you spending your time? What are you doing all day? And that's kind of how you figure out really, like in, in terms of like helping them with their engagement. And I say that like, it's not easy to do that. And it's time consuming to have those kinds of conversations. But that is another way to think about like, how can you maybe have those conversations with them to have because they don't know how to manage their time, honestly. And they know that it's important and they think they're doing it. But until you can actually like see what they're doing and check their work, like I promise you, you even the students that I have that are like on top of it, when we really talk about some of their habits, I'm like, whoa, wait, what are you doing? This isn't really the most effective way. To, like, yes, you're doing well, but there are ways that you could have done this to even be more efficient if you like, if I would have known that you were wasting time or you know you didn't have the purpose proper study strategies or you weren't getting support from from people that could help you so yeah i think it's really it's it's, it's a lot so i say i would say like cheryl said y'all got a hard job 
So <laughs> uh, Cammy's bringing up a really great point. Cammy, I don't want to put you on the spot. It, would you mind like unmuting to be able Absolutely. to? Shift? Absolutely. Um, so this is something that was brought up, like even when we were evaluating our program at CCBC, I work in a school in Baltimore, Maryland. And um, the reality sometimes is that we are given a grant or given a structure that is deficit-based. And how can we do a little bit of a 180 there and you know, still be compliant, obviously, but present it to the students in a way that is not so demoralizing. Honestly, it's like depressing. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm so glad. So I'm jumping around a little bit, but I'm glad that you asked that question. And so one of the ways that you can do that is by having like a strength-based focus, right? Mm -hmm. And so instead of saying, hey, we know that your math and your science are lacking here, come here and let us help you. Finding ways to advertise it where it's like, hey, are you a student that's really good at problem solving? Are you looking for a really cool career that you might come join us and we can tell you how you might be able to make that. So like focusing on the things that you know they're going to get out of the program yep. instead of the reasons why they might come to the program. If that yeah, means. the eligibility That's pieces. Got found. Yeah. You gotta, it's kind of like you hide the medicine and the sugar. <laughs> so like, you know, you're going to give them something that they need, but they don't need to know that they can just. So I like to really focus on when I do um, uh, this kind of work. Uh, using in, in flyers and stuff, like all of the skills and soft things that you know they're going to walk away with and say, hey, are you interested in learning how to be a better communicator? And like, just because that's really what it's about is like, hey, we're going to make sure you walk away with these things. It doesn't matter what they come in with, honestly. And I <laughs> and ultimately, at the end of the day, you guys are committed to helping them get to a certain level. So that's really where that that's your product. Your product isn't their, like what they're lacking. Your product is all the amazing things you can help them with. So. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, and I love the specifics of that because my essentially like my first thought and what I try and implement is a culture of honor and scholarship. And it's like, y'all made it here. Like these are the mm -hmm. best of, you know, like that we have selected you and you're a student mm -hmm. ambassador in the community and building it up in that way. Um, but thank you for the, like, I wrote, I jotted down definitely some of the things <laughs> that well, you so mentioned. Like, if I could at least even give you one thing that you find helpful, I feel like I did a good enough job. That's yeah, so thank you. <laughs> so great. Yes. And it's really hard. It's one of those things that is challenging because like you said, a lot of the, even the way that we were trained in our graduate program and, and like to think about these issues was always more so from a, wow, what is it that, you know, how can we get our students prepared? Um, and so the other way to think about that too, in terms of your individual conversations with students um, that I often say to students is like, if you are lacking something, that was a teacher somewhere along the line that it was their job to get you prepared. I'm not going to hold you accountable for what your teachers didn't do, right? So having, reframing that for them is like, they're like, you know, I never thought about it like that. Like, that's not your failure. Your teacher is somewhere, somewhere, somewhere along the line. Someone either made you too afraid to ask for help. They either made you think that science was too hard and you need to fix, like there's something there. I don't know what it was, but that's not your, you know, I'm not gonna hold you accountable for that. So I'm sorry, Cam, you wanted to say something else. Yeah, no, to piggyback off of that, I didn't realize that not all of the high schools in this area even offer chemistry, even offer physics. Most of them only have a biology class. So, you know, again, like you said, how can we hold, how can we say that that's a personal fault? It's not, it's a system. So, and that goes you. back to so when we're thinking about this deficit model thing, right? It's like, oh, this student lacks the skills. And it's like, but they were never even offered the opportunity to get those skills, right? And so how can we reframe that so that the students are aware of that? Like, hey, these were systemic challenges that you battled. Like, we, we understand why you have this gap and it's not on you. But right now there really isn't, there's more shame placed around it. And there really is that more of the like, well, you're not prepared. And so you're going to have to work twice as hard to get where everyone else is. And that really isn't the messaging um, that we would want to want to go with. So yeah, I see some more comments. I'm sorry if I'm cutting anybody off. Thinking of cultural barriers uh, and women gaining familiar support and speaking of career in STEM. Also generally supporting and thinking of STEM as a viable pathway for success. Oh. There's a lot of time and resources put into sports and music, for example. Oh, it'd be nice to have a great cultural shift. Uh, pouring these resources and time into a STEM pathway. I 100% agree with a lot of that. I've seen, you know, and I definitely don't necessarily have answers, um, but I will say what I've found helpful as much as possible is trying to get the families involved because just as much as our students are lacking certain knowledge, our, the families are too, they have no idea. And they really are coming from a place of like, I just want the best for my child. And oftentimes when I'm able to help, so one of the things I help students do though, when it comes to pursuing 
certain careers is like, all right, your parents are going to want to see the numbers. They want to see that you're going to be successful. Let's pull, let's, how can we present this to them in a way where it highlights the things that are important to them too, so that they see, but I think it's still just, that's just the strategy. And it's not like that always is hundred percent successful, but I, it does kind of help sometimes, you know, to have parents kind of look at it from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. I Thanks for sharing that, Lachelle. I think, I know we need to move on, but I no, just wanted fine. to tap Myra, because Myra, I know you have experience with this. I know you've run like a few parent nights and like info sessions and like even hosting sessions in Spanish for um, like, as like we do like recruiting for um, our programming. And sometimes like, I know that's not always feasible, but um, in certain situations, being able to get out into the community and show students and parents that like we're reaching out and these are the opportunities and like Lachelle said too I think very often if our students and their parents don't have anybody in their family who's ever been an engineer who's ever worked in the stem fields sometimes like showing those hard numbers if you're hired as an engineering technologist you are likely to make x amount of dollars versus if you get your bachelor's degree um, we're connecting our students with potential placements at Berkeley lab at Sandia here's what you could start making immediately after graduation and even in your internship placement. So sometimes like numbers talk, but oftentimes students are very much swayed by their family. Um, so however we can reach out to them is super important. Absolutely. And I definitely think some of that too is um, what I've learned is students have their own shame around certain things and disappoint in their parents. But oftentimes that's not necessarily rooted in like facts or reality is more so their perception of how their parents will respond. And like a lot of times, again, when I get to the reality of it, and the parents are like, no, I just want them to do well. Like I, and so I think the reason it's kind of like a game of telephone, right? Like we know what's good for the students, but then we expect them to kind of translate that to their parents. And I don't think the message gets sent the correct way. And I think that's why parents are like, nah, I don't think you should do this. Right. Like I think, and that's where, like Cheryl said, those hard numbers are helpful because it's like here, this, this, is a, this is a good clear picture that you can't you know you can't mess this up so but yes I'm going to keep going and talk but I love this this is kind of what I wanted to be able to like address things that you all found um you know that would be helpful so yes I'll move on so one of the and so as we start to talk about this too though one of, I love uh, I don't know if you all are familiar with Brene Brown um but she is really good um she's very popular right now but she does a lot of work around vulnerability um and courage and I think um, one of the ways and one of the reasons why I think I've been so successful with connecting with students and engaging them is because I keep it real with them. And I, I don't like, like, yes, I'm a professional and I'm not going to cross that boundary, but having a certain level of vulnerability. So sharing my own stories when it comes to struggles with science and, you know, struggles in college in general or in life, I think has been very helpful. Um, and so I have these two little quick clips here that she talks about that I think, um, are, are just good to keep in mind as we think about um, the importance of engagement and like how we how we do that with our students. Actually, I just realized I did not share my, um, I didn't put the sound on, but now I did. And hopefully, can you still see my screen or did I mess that up? I probably messed, I feel like I messed that up. I'm gonna do it one more time. It was the, <laughs> um, it was the partial view again. Uh, I'm sorry, someone said something. There you go, we can see it. Okay, good. I remember being at Fort Bragg and asking a group of special forces troops, give me an example, give me an example of courage that you experienced in your life on the field or off the field, or you saw in someone else that didn't require uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure. Right. And there was this long silence. And finally, a young man stood up and said, three tours, ma'am, there is no courage without vulnerability. Yeah. I don't think you can get to courage without the capacity to deal with uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure. And we've mythologized vulnerability. We've as created weakness. this ideal yes. that's ultimately unrealistic. Yeah, and right. it's like that it's, that it's weakness, that it's oversharing. Right. That, you know, people will say to me, I read Dare to Lead. I'm going to be a brave leader. How much should I cry? How much should I share? <laughs> you know, and I'm like, right. As if there's a cheat sheet, right? And, and yeah, and as if we want, you know, oversharing crying leaders. I mean, like, if it's a genuine thing, do it. But I'm not saying be vulnerable for vulnerability's sake. I'm saying when things get hard and uncomfortable, don't tap out of difficult conversations. Right. Stay in them, lean into them, even when they're uncomfortable, awkward, hard. I remember being... 
So I, I like to share that clip because I think what we're asking, this is really what we're asking of our students. We're asking them to be vulnerable um, because I think that success, to be successful in any field, but especially in the sciences, is going to take vulnerability because you need to be able to share what's going wrong, what you're, what you're afraid of, what you need help with. And I think there's a definitely sometimes a struggle uh, with our students because we really don't even know often what they're even uh, battling. We don't even know what um, is, is going on in their heads. Um, and so I, I'm going to come back to the comments, but in the second clip, she talks about how can we, about creating those spaces where students can be um, vulnerable. So I want to. We're wired for love. We're hardwired for belonging. It's in our DNA. But let me tell you what belonging is. The opposite of belonging from the research is fitting in. That's the opposite of belonging. Fitting in is assessing and acclimating. Here's what I should say, be. Here's what I shouldn't say. Here's what I should avoid talking about. Here's what I should dress like, look like. That's fitting in. Belonging is belonging to yourself first. Speaking your truth, telling your story, and never betraying yourself for other people. True belonging doesn't require you to change who you are. It requires you to be who you are. And that's vulnerable. I'm going to stop there. But as she said, I'm going to stop sharing because I want to see you all again uh, for a few minutes. But um, as she said, though, it's really um, also, too, about... Um, not just being vulnerable for vulnerability's sake and not just our students feeling like they need to fit in. And I think oftentimes, especially in the STEM, we really do focus on like, how can they fit in, right? Like, how do you follow the rules so that you can get what you need? But it's like, how can we also though now move away from that to creating more spaces where they feel like they belong in those spaces where they don't have to give up their culture and their, the things that are important to them that are not um, necessarily valued in those spaces and how can we make them feel like they're valued? Um, and so some of the things, you know, having conversations that are not, you know, directly related to the things that are like math and science and providing those community building spaces that I mentioned earlier are really key because it, it may not seem directly related, but the more the students have that sense of belonging and like, oh, that, you know, the things that aren't necessarily academic matter here and that I can talk about those things here, it makes it comfortable then to talk about the academics and the things that might be impacting those things. So just wanted to share that um, and then see if I want to pause and see if anyone else I saw I've seen some great things in the comments if anyone wanted to like jump in and and share anything that they put in the comments or talk about you know at any other comments at this time let me know uh, okay I'll share my screen again hopefully I'll get it right on the first time I think I will yay okay I did <laughs> so uh, moving right along, so how we can think about like overcoming engagement challenges. Um, and so one of the other things too is just to kind of call those things out, right? And so when I'm talking to students, like just being able to say, hey, I know there's been some things that you've experienced that have been really crappy up until this point. Um, really often opens up a really um, good conversation with our students. Um, and so I, I have a video here. I won't show the, sec the, the the video about imposter syndrome. Well, I mean, I can, but I think most of us are familiar with the, the concept of imposterism, but it is important that we acknowledge that and we help our students overcome that because oftentimes their engagement challenges are directly related to them feeling like they don't belong, like they're not worthy, or like there's some type of fluke that they are, you know, in the circumstance, in the in the situation that they're in now. So it really is good to think about how can we help our students um, overcome that. Um, and one of the ways that I often help, I like to help in students overcome battling imposter syndrome is helping them um, develop and cultivate like a growth mindset. And so if you were in my student, my session with the students, you've heard some of this before. Um, and there's a reason for that because I, I, what I tell you is what I tell the students because we are, that's why I, um, when I was thinking about this presentation, it's called It's a Village, right? Like we're in this together. Right, and so the same thing that the students are concerned about, these are the things that we need to be helping to manage. And that's really how we can um, increase engagement in our program. So thinking about how we can help them develop a growth mindset. Um, and then I wanna talk a little bit too about that strengths approach, right? And, and, and some ways that we can go away from moving. We can move away from talking about the things that they don't bring to the table, but how can we focus more so on their strengths? Um, up and went away. Okay, there we go. So this is a, uh, I shared this in the last session with the students, but um, these are just some ways that are, um, that we can help our students cope with imposter syndrome. Um, and so the first thing is knowing the signs, right? And like oftentimes when you hear students that won't be able to, that, that are not able to accept compliments 
or you notice that they're always underselling their skills or no that I, oh I just had to do that those are usually signs that the students are, are are struggling maybe to feel like connected or like they belong I'm actually gonna I see Cammy that you put another um uh comment in the chat did you want to uh did you want to say something or I didn't want to over talk you Oh no, I don't want to over talk either. But um, so I, I was looking at a one of the comments that um, you know, students don't go forward to opportunities because their parents don't want them in a certain environment or don't feel comfortable with them traveling. And our we had one student who got, you know, not that it's a competition, but if it was, she would have had the best internship. Bar none. I'm sorry. She made it to the Ivy Leagues. Let's be real. So she, we were going to send her there. And the night before she called me sobbing, saying, my dad doesn't want me to go to New York City. I can't go. And I was like, who are your allies? Who is in your corner? And she said, mom and brother were supportive. And I was like, time for a family meeting. <laughs> like, I would do whatever you have to do. And she made it there. But she almost didn't go because her dad was like, no, I don't. I don't want you physically being in a big city by yourself. Oh, I know. And it's so hard when we have those conversations because it's like, but wait, why? No. Um, and, 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 and you win some and you lose some. And, and that's, I think, something important to remember, too. Like what we do is important, but we can't like as much as we want to help everybody and see them win, that there's going to be some times where we just are not able to do that. Um, and it's not any discredit to us in our work. It's not that we didn't try hard enough. Yeah. Some it's up to the students. Like we just said, they're 18, 19, 20, 21. They get to they have the final say. No, so sometimes like the, the situation is such where they're like, I have two students who are indefinitely stuck overseas who are on break from STEM court because parents are like, hey, we're going to be overseas for a semester and they don't have any say. So it's like, you know what? There, there definitely are some things that it's like, I can't touch that, you know? Yeah. And, and it's not any fault of yours. And, it, you know, and I think it's just hard to not take that personal, like, like, oh, what, what can I say? Like, uh, but there's just, unfortunately, you win some, you lose some. And I think that was the hardest thing for me to realize in my job, because I want every student to, like, graduate and be successful. But, you you know, there's sometimes outside forces that we, um, we don't have any say in. Um, and that's just the reality of it. Um, and someone also said in the comments that, you know, even at an HBCU, students are impacted by imposter syndrome. I'm so glad you brought that up because one of the things that I feel, I felt that, right? Like I've definitely been around other people of color and or black people and have felt imposter syndrome because it's important to know that we, when looking back at all of the things that make up our identities, right? We don't all, like, no one's uh, puzzle pieces are all going to be the same. The things that make us up aren't going to be the same. So while I may be, you know, from the same uh, ethnic background as someone, our socioeconomic status, our religion, our, you know, our abilities, like I, just so many different things are going to be different and layered. And so it is very much possible to be around people who, you know, on the surface, you may feel look like you, but you may still feel like I don't belong. And I, you know, I'm not, you know, comfortable or I don't, I, you know, uh, someone's going to figure me out. I'm an imposter. So I absolutely can understand um, where those feelings are coming from. And it's important to note too, in the video, the clip that I, I was going to share, one of the things that they highlight that I think is really important is that the, some of the earliest uh, signs of like imposterism in literature came from Albert Einstein. He was one of the first people that wrote about it. Now, I want you to think about that for a second. We're talking about Albert Einstein. That is the person we literally will quote as the smartest person. He felt inadequate. He often felt like, you know, his work wasn't, you know, relevant, that people were judging him. And so if some, and then the other case that they talk about is um, Maya Angelou, who in her early work, um, in her poems, she taught, even after she was winning awards for being like the best poet ever, she felt like, well, my poems really aren't that great. And maybe people are just giving me a pass because of X, Y, Z. And so this is something that is pervasive and that a lot of students, like not even a lot of students, everybody feels this in one way or another, regardless of your, your social class, economic status, but then those things can make it even more difficult. So it's important that like we understand that and we help, we think about how we can help our students kind of overcome that. Um, and so one of the things that is um, seen as the research says, one of the ways that you can kind of overcome imposterism or feelings of imposterism is talking about it. And that goes back to what I was saying about the importance of community building space, having opportunities for students to just process and just talk about, you know, and knowing that they're not alone when it comes to feeling like they don't have, like they're not enough is very helpful. Um, and then also that, oh, when we talk about the pressure and the perfectionism, 
especially in a lot of um, STEM fields, there's always that, like, if you, you know, students are always putting that pressure on themselves to get straight A's and 4.0s. And it's like, listen, you can have a 3.5 and get a really good job. You can get a 3.0 and get a really good job, right? I mean, sure, I know people who have less than it. I'm not encouraging it, but let's be honest, right? You don't necessarily need perfection to be successful. And our students don't always realize that. And so helping them kind of process that and be kind to themselves um, is really helpful uh, when working with students through that. Awesome. Um, and then helping them track their success. So one of the other things I think is helpful with our students is like as they're doing things, helping them write that down and track their success because they don't really, they, I feel like a lot of students will underestimate how much work they're putting in and how much they've grown. Um, and so yes, having, and you all too like serve a valuable role as their mentors. Um, and then saying, help, helping them, encouraging them to say yes to opportunities as much as we can. And then again, with the last thing is just embracing the feeling. And that, and, what, and by that, I mean, just knowing that that exists and knowing that like you kind of got, so being afraid and doing it anyway is kind of what I often like to say. Like, yeah, I know you're afraid. I know it feels uncomfortable. Let's just do it anyway. See what happens. Um, so those are just some things to think about when we are uh, talking with students. Um, and again, I mentioned talking to them about developing a growth mindset. So many of our students feel like, if they like I hate when I hear like oh I'm just bad at science or I'm just bad at math no one is no one's abilities are fixed right when it comes to math or academics you can put in enough work with enough time you can get better at it and so that's really what we talk about with developing a growth mindset when we hear students saying oh I can't do that or I've never been able to it's like how can we help them change their perception around those things um, and then show them the opportunities that are available to get better at those things I won't read all of these to you, but I will definitely share these with Cheryl so that if you wanted to look at these, you can definitely do that. Um, and then lastly, and then we're gonna go into some breakout rooms, but when we talk about um, the strengths-based approach, right? So strengths-based strength advising and the strengths-based approach is kind of the answer to the deficit model thinking. So that's where this, this whole idea of strengths-based learning comes. And it's really the hottest trend in education. So when I, um, the National Education Association um, has a whole report on how to incorporate strengths-based advising into your work. So if you are looking to learn more about that, that's a real, I can definitely share the link, um, but they actually we had some really good resources. Um, and so I just kind of copied a, a couple of them, the, the ones that I thought that were really good, but they really do have more. Um, and so that's some other thing to tell you, don't reinvent the wheel, right? So when it comes to this, I saw curriculums, programs, workshops, all based around the idea of strengths-based advising. Um, and a lot of them was on the NEA's website. And then there was another university, Illinois State. Illinois State had a really good, like, um, a lot of good resources for how you can uh, incorporate that. And so um, I think those are, so you don't have to like start from scratch, um, but these are just a few of the one, ways that you can kind of reshape our conversations with students to focus more so on what is it that you do have that you can bring to the table? So like, okay, you're not good at math, but are you a good communicator? Are you good at asking for help? Because if you're good in those things, then we can get you good in math, right? And so just reframing that for our students. So. I, I don't know if I put my, I realized I didn't, I'm going to put the, oh yeah, uh, okay, a low B student can be much more, I agree with that about the well-roundedness of students too, right, because I, I you, you can get straight A's all you want, but if you don't have some of those thought skills, how is that going to translate or transfer into your, your interviews, internships, and things like that, and that's what I mean by strengths-based advising, so if you have a student who, where the academic skills may be lagging, what soft skills do they have that maybe you can highlight and how can those soft skills help them in those academic classes? Um, so I, now would be a good time. I think we're gonna do some, um, a quick little breakout room um, so that you all can uh, have a chance to kind of chat a little bit more. And so we have two questions for you and I'm gonna paste the questions in the chat, but really just spending a few minutes thinking about how can you move away from um, deficit model thinking? Like where are some ways, where are some areas where you may have realized that you were, Hmm, maybe that was really framed in a deficit model and maybe how can you um, uh, change that perception? And then the other question is when we think about belonging, like how, what are some ways that um, in STEM core that you may be able to move from, you know, having students feel like they fit in versus creating spaces for belonging? So I'm gonna drop those in the chat and then Cheryl is going to open up some breakout rooms and then we'll come back together and process as a group. And before we wrap up and okay. <laughs> hello, everyone. Awesome. Thanks everyone for being so punctual and coming right back um, on schedule. Um, 
Yeah, so I think we're going to do a little bit of um, sharing what we talked about in our groups. Yeah, does anyone want to share anything that they talked about? I mean, it doesn't have to be both questions. It could be it could be one, it could be both, or just anything in general that you might have talked about in terms of belonging and moving away from a deficit model of thinking to strength-based model. One of the things that we talked about was having um, having them have the experience first of being in a group, even if it's sort of distant by meeting with the advisor and then having um, just going through what happened in a, in a group so that they feel like they want to be part of it. But then there's the question of if they feel like they don't have time, then how do you get them to have the time so they have the experience? I know it's like, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Do you get them into your program and then you give them the skills? Or do they need the skills before the, you know, like the time management piece? But uh, that's a really good point. I think the time management thing is a struggle and um, having individual conversations with them about it and like the reality of, and the benefits, hopefully they'll want to make time for it. Um, but we were just talking, that's just good. I think that's a continuous struggle with students because of just a lot of different reasons. But, you know, I appreciate you sharing that though. And it is something to continue to think about. Other thoughts on things that you might want to think about or other things that you talked about that you wanted to share? Well, so I would love a little bit of input from people. Um, like on an intuitive level, I certainly understand the value of belonging. Um, but like, I absolutely was that STEM student that never went to anything because I was like, I don't have time for this. I got homework. And so like, because I didn't do anything outside of class as a student, I don't really know how to encourage my students to go to these things. I don't know how to tell them that it's valuable. Like I still, you know, sometimes my students are like, oh yeah, I got involved with this club. And so now I'm the club president. And so now like, I got 10 hours a week where I got to do all this stuff. And there's still this voice in the back of my head that is like, that is a waste of your time. Stop doing that and go do homework. Of course, I don't say that out loud. You know, like out loud, I'm like, that's amazing. Being involved in things outside of class is really, really good for you. Like it enriches your sense of yourself as a person. You'll do better in school because of those relationships. I say all of those things, but I just like, I don't, I don't know how to create that kind of engagement for people because I've never had it. And so Cami spoke to it in the chat. It was one of the things I was going to say, giving examples. Um, and so it can be your own examples or it can be examples of other students, but also even just sharing what your experience was and how it was different. That I think that's where the belonging and the vulnerability comes in. Like, it's okay to say, hey, you know, I didn't necessarily get involved, but it's great that you did. Like, you can be genuine to who you are. There's also value in faking it until you make it. Like, don't, do, I think what you're doing is what I would do. Like, mm, that sounds amazing. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with faking it until you make it, you know? Um, but yes, giving examples. And then I missed that experience as a transfer student. And then I asked the, the students what, uh, what they need and go from there. So that, yeah. So this also too, just focusing on, well, what is it that they need and what they hope to get out of certain experiences? So like, even if you don't understand it, um, you know, the more you, and, and so asking using the opportunity to ask them questions about so what made you get involved with that and how is that going to connect to what you're doing in the future because you really don't understand it and you genuinely are trying to figure that out but I also think that helps the students reflect too on is that something that they should be maybe spending their time on or and and or maybe even just finding the value in something that they're doing and so helping you understand that might actually be a really good way for you to build relationships with students like you're investing in now trying to figure out why are you doing that what is it about when do you meet? <laughs> so I think that could actually be an opportunity there. But yeah, thank you for that though, because I, I, it can be a struggle. Uh, and I feel that, so, and just to give you some context, I feel the opposite because I hated science and math in college. And so I'm sitting here now in this job where I have to encourage them and be like, and they come in and they're like, I got 16 credits and I'm taking bio and math and chemistry. And I'm like, that is a shitty schedule. You should change that. But then I can't say that out loud, of course, but like, they're not, so that also brings me, I'm so glad you said that because it brings me to something that I often think of too. And so in the movie, The Pursuit of Happiness, I love that movie if you've never seen it with Will Smith, but there is a point, a part in that movie where he's on the roof playing basketball with his son and his son says, I want to be an NBA player. 
And his dad turns around and is like, you're not going to be no NBA player. The men in our family are not coordinated. We're short. We're never, we're not athletic. And he turns and he sees that he's, his son is just deflated. And he's just like hopeless. And he says to his son something that has stuck with me that I often try to remember when I'm working with my students. Do not put your limitations and your fears and your expectations onto someone else. That is your fear and limitation. That's your experience. It doesn't mean that they have the same one. And it's, it's, it's important to acknowledge that we're all different. And he was like, here I am telling you, you can't be a basketball player because I can't imagine it for myself. Like you can't, so, you know, just keeping that in mind is that we all just have different experiences. And like, so I had to, I had to tell myself that I had to, cause my first year as an advisor, I think I was like, mm, you sure you want to take that together? But it's like, that's something I wouldn't want to take together. I can't put that on the student. So I think you, like when you were saying you just fake it, I think that's a good strategy. Cause you don't want to put that onto, we don't want to put our fears and limitations and expectations onto them. I know we only have a few minutes left, so I just wanted to kind of, uh, I had like, I'll show my last little slide with my little recap, um, my little recap of what we've kind of talked about. Why can't I see the, oh, here we go. So here we go. Let's do that. Here we go. So just a quick recap. And it's funny that you wrote, uh, someone had put this in the chat, but sharing success stories is a really great way when we want to think about increasing engagement, the more that they can imagine themselves in that, in that space by seeing other students who have done it and have come before them is a really great way to um, encourage our students. Helping them get connected to peers and, and faculty as much as possible has also been proven to help when it comes to students being engaged and stuff. If they see that people care about them, they want to, they want to help, they want to uh, make those people proud. Um, and then we talked about helping the students develop a growth mindset you know, moving away from deficit thinking and using strength-based strength, strength based advising, from providing space for students to, you know, um, build community and, and cultivate belonging. Um, and then the last thing I will mention is considering the effects that the pandemic has had, you know, students may be struggling to reach out. And so one of the things that I will, the last thing I will say is like, don't give up. And so sometimes it means you're sending 10 messages, multiple reminders about a program, like you have to kind of be intrusive in a sense. Um, so don't give up, you know, sometimes you just got to keep talking to them. Um, and then the only, the one other thing I will mention that actually uh, um, I, I learned this week, that like when interacting with students that I will add to this, that um, I think has helped with engagement is we often think that we need to find motivation to do things when really it's, we need to do things to get motivated. So when you think about that, that blew my mind, y'all. I don't know about y'all. But I thought about that. Everything that you've ever done, it's usually, it's usually we we think about motivation in the wrong way. We're thinking that we need to find this motivation and then it will allow all these amazing outcomes. But usually we have to tap into things or do things that make us feel motivated. So is it listening to a song? Is it eating our favorite food? Is it calling our parents? And then those things can kind of lead to, all right, so after you've had a positive phone call with your parents, all right. Take that energy and go study something, right? Versus the other way of like trying to build up this mythical energy to start something that you think is difficult. So anyway, that's a student actually came to me and said that. And I was like, wow, I'm going to use that. That's a great way to think about things. Like, so if you find that students are lacking motivation, starting with some really small thing that maybe they can do that might spark the motivation. Like what's one thing that makes you happy? What's one thing that gets you in a good mood? It doesn't even need to be academically related, but it may be able to lead to more positive changes down the line. So that is it. That's my last thing. Thank you all for letting me talk your heads off this afternoon. I appreciate it. Um, and I will share my slides and contact information with Cheryl. Please feel free at any time if you ever have any questions, want to chat about a student concern. You know, I learned from you all as well. So I would love to continue the conversations wherever possible. Awesome. Huge thank you, Lachelle. Um, I will be following up with the recording link um, and the slide deck and other resources that Lachelle shares, but huge, huge thank you. Um, have a great rest of your week, everybody.